Jesus. Thank you all for hanging in there. Um, so this, Lauren wanted me to give an update on um, our antibody study. So for those of you who are veterans and that have been to this meeting over many years, um, we did a study at the 2014 meeting, which was the first annual patient study. I think since then there's been a study at every meeting. And we did a whole bunch of things, but largely the study came on the heels of a paper that we had published um, with David Kem's group in Oklahoma, showing the presence of autoantibodies to alpha and beta receptors, and we'll get into that a little bit, um, in a small group of patients. So in total, we studied, you published, the published paper had 14 POTS patients and 10 controls, so not a huge number. And so the goal of this was to try and get a broader sense of what was there. Um, were there? Are there people here that were in that study? Okay, so before you ask where your data is, because um, it hasn't been sent out yet, we, we have some data, but you're, what you're gonna see is that uh, this has been a journey. You know, this sort of started off, you know, the part of it is the assay that was used in that original paper um, used a, well, we'll get to that. It, it basically was, a, it, it, it's a difficult assay to do and not a high throughput assay, so we were, in the process for the last several years of trying to redevelop assays, and um, it's led to challenges. But that's part of what I want to talk to you about is, is the challenges and stuff we've learned. So just going a step back, there is a lot of uh, interest, a lot of smoke, if you will, around the whole issue of autoantibodies in POTS. Um, this paper from Svetlana Blitchin's group, published, I guess, back in 2015, basically says that if you pick an autoimmune disorder or an autoantibody, it seems like a group of POTS patients have a slightly higher prevalence or amount of it than the general population. The POTS patients are in blue and the general population data is in orange. But if you look at this, it's hard to sort of pick out the thing that associates with POTS, right? It's a rather nonspecific increase, where every, little, every category has a little bit more in the POTS patient group than in the non-POTS patient group. On the heels of that, uh, there was a study done by Wolfgang Singer at Mayo, and this is actually listed incorrectly. It's not the AAS meeting 2014, it's actually, or sorry, this was, I think it's the 2015 meeting, so this was the meeting after our meeting, he came into the study at, at the DI meeting. And they took samples and went back to Mayo and ran it through their clinical lab. So instead of, you know, Svetlana had sort of gone through records and said, okay, we've seen these people and some had these tests, they basically collected samples prospectively and ran it through the lab and then they had control data from the lab. People at Mayo that had had autoantibody testing, a huge panel that didn't have POTS presumably. And what they found was that over a third of the POTS patients tested positive for at least one antibody compared to about 5% in the control population. Now again, the problem here is that when I say at least one antibody, it was a different antibody in most people, right? So everything, there was a few with thyroid antibodies, a few with you know, anti-double-stranded DNA, some suggesting lupus. There was a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but there wasn't one antibody that jumped out saying, this is significant, this we think is a problem. So I think, what I take from, from those two papers, and, and there may be others like it that I'm not fully aware of, is that there's a general autoimmune tendency, but I doubt any of the specific things that were enumerated in Svetlana's study or any of the specific antibodies that were looked at in the Mayo study are the POTS antibody, if you will, are causative for POTS. So in the autonomic space, I guess the antibody that really has had the most written about it, the most, is the most studied and, and probably the most important known antibody, is an antibody that targets the autonomic ganglia. So it targets a specific type of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that's pretty unique, not 100% unique, but pretty unique to the autonomic ganglia. And this was described by Steve Renino, um, who's on the medical advisory board and Vonda uh, Lennon at Mayo, um, until for several years, the Mayo labs were the only people that ran this antibody clinically. I think there are a few other labs that do it now. Um, and it is the putative antibodies, the antibody that is the problem, 
in a disorder called autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy. Now, this is a disorder that presents very differently than POTS. This, the ones I've seen, patients I've seen, present with orthostatic hypotension with a lot of gut issues and funny eye movements and stuff, but it's, it's, it's not a POTS or tachycardia presentation primarily. But in that original paper um, that was, where this was described back in the New England Journal, they said 70% of POTS patients had it that they studied. Now, what you had to read the paper more closely to realize was that was one patient. Right, so, you know, hard to know what to make of that, but 7%, at least initially, didn't seem like an insignificant number. So there was a period of time in my life when I was at Vanderbilt where, for about two years, every POTS patient that came to us clinically, we sent off this antibody panel, and we sent it to Mayo. So the Vanderbilt labs didn't do this. It was a send-out. We sent it to the Mayo lab. So presumably the same assay, the same test that the Mayo people would be using as well. And um, I found, no pa found exactly zero, right? There were no patients, no POTS patients that came back positive. So this led to some confusion, if nothing else, um, on my part. And part of what came out of that is that from that study we did at the DI meeting in 2014, we took some of those samples and shared it, blinded samples with Steve Vernino, to run the assay, because he still has a research lab where he runs this assay. And what he found is if you use the cut point of 0 0.2, which is basically, you know, the positive, negative, lower limit cut point that's used clinically, about 10% or 10 to 11% of POTS patients were positive. But then so were 8% of the control subjects, right? So it's, it's a fairly, you know, that low titer is fairly nonspecific. If you use a slightly higher threshold of 0 0.05, the numbers were cut in half. Now, importantly, these are both numbers below which I don't think anyone in their right mind would treat. In fact, when we treat patients, often their titer level is above one or sometimes above two, right, the orthostatic hypotension patients, and there was no one, I think, above 0.1, right? So there was, what I take from that is there's a grumbling low level of positivity for this titer, but at no cut point was the prevalence significantly higher in the POTS group than in just the general population. So specific interests, I think, um, in the POTS community, certainly over the last couple of years, are autoantibodies to adrenergic receptors. So alpha receptors, beta receptors, that are vascular and cardiac receptors. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that these can be assessed. So first of all, the reason these are of interest is that we think it's at least plausible. We don't know, but it's plausible that these could be causative in POTS. So mitodrine, which is a drug that many of you will have heard of, and some of you may be on, works on the alpha-1 receptor. Propranolol or beta blockers, the beta they're blocking are the beta adrenergic receptors, right? So the drugs we commonly use actually work on these receptors, so it sort of makes sense that maybe this plays a more mechanistic role in causing the problem. So there are a couple of different philosophical ways you can sort of look for this. Um, so one way, and this is the approach used by Celltrend, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with this, but it's a, commercial, a commercially available antibody lab based in Germany um, that looks for G protein coupled receptors, so alpha, beta, alpha receptors, beta receptors, muscarinic receptors, a few other things. Um, and I've certainly seen patients who have sent over a sample of blood and a lot of money. Um, and gotten results back and then come to clinic going, what does this mean? And the challenge is, is we don't know for lots of reasons, but just to understand what they're doing, they're doing what's called an ELISA assay, right? So what they have is they have an antibody that then they can mark with fluorescence or you know, something where they can measure it that is an antibody to a protein fragment from each of these antibodies. So it's not each of these receptors. So it's not looking at the whole receptor, it's looking at a little bit of receptor, and that leads to its own challenges in terms of um, you know, are you picking up, if, if the receptor is there, are you picking it up? If the receptor is not, you know, if the receptor antibody is there, are you picking it up properly? If it's not there, are you missing it? So there's sensitivity and specificity issues. But there's actually a bigger problem. Um, so let's assume that all the technical issues about how good the ELISA is are sorted and it's a perfect ELISA assay. The presence of something doesn't mean it's doing anything. Right, so all it's telling you is if there's a protein fragment <coughs> in the blood sample or not. It's not telling you that it's functioning in any way or doing anything in any way. 
right? So that's, this is the ELISA. This is sort of an assay. One big advantage of the ELISA is it's easy. It's easier in terms of coming up with a high throughput assay. So if we want to start a lab and run a bunch of patient samples through it, you need something that's easily doable. So the other approach has been to use a functional assay. And um, it's versions of this that, have, uh, that we've been using with David Kem's group in Oklahoma, um, Arthur Fedorowski and uh, Dr. Axelson's group in, um, in Sweden have, been, have used this as well or something very, they've used this specific assay. And basically what this assay does is it has a cell with the receptor on it and then you add the serum, the patient blood component to it, and you see if it activates the receptor and the cell reports back in a different way. So this is actually telling you if it's doing something. The downside of this is it's more of a nuisance. It's more difficult to do, it's more costly, um, and it's generally a pain in the butt. So just to go back over the data from um, our original data, if you look at the control subjects in that original group that we studied, the three bars on the left, really the control serum did nothing to uh, a little arterial assay. This is a physiology assay where we took a little bit of blood vessel from a rat that it did not want to give up willingly. Um, and stretch it out and then added stuff to it. And no matter what you added or drug-wise or serum-wise, nothing happened, right? So the, nothing in the serum was really doing anything. But in the POTS patient, when you added the serum, the vessel squished a lot. When you added a beta blocker, the vessel squished a little more. And then when you added an alpha blocker, the vessel unsquished, right? Suggesting that there was alpha activity, alpha adrenergic activity or squishability in the blood, right? So problem is it's a small study. Um, who knows if it can be replicated? Um, but it has, right? So this is a publication from Arthur Fedorowski's group um, that similarly showed that there was a high level of alpha-1 adrenergic receptor activity in POTS patients. And if you look at these bars in the bottom, the open bars are the activity with just the patient serum, the patient blood. And then when you add an alpha blocker, you decrease the activity, right? So it's a functional assay. It's actually working on that receptor. Now, it gets a bit more complicated, actually, as it turns out, because it turns out the antibodies not only activate the receptor, but it, it's what's called a partial antagonist. So it activates the receptor, but then it blocks other drugs from further activating the receptor. Getting an evil eye. Um, on the, uh, there's also activity on the beta receptor, which causes the heart rate to go up a little bit. So we created a model. This has been published. I won't go over this in detail because I'm over time, but it's very colorful. And if you're bored one day and having trouble sleeping, I recommend printing it out and staring at it. Um, I'd appreciate it. But basically, what we came up with was, you know, but basically, you know, I think several groups now, multiple groups, have shown that they, there's uh, IgG in some POTS patients, not all, that has. Um, partial agonist, partial antagonist activity to the alpha-1 receptor. And in, not, in fewer patients, there's beta-1 and beta-2 activity as well. Now the problem with all of this is this is all bench work, right? This is all stuff on the bench. And we haven't yet to show that this actually works in people. And that's actually a study we're doing right now in Calgary. I have CHR funding where we're giving drugs like phenylephrine, like we did in this bench study, to people and looking at how much it takes to raise the blood pressure to see if we can shift the curve based on the antibody level. Uh, so the reason I think Lauren insisted I present something today is that we finally published our first paper related to this um, just a short while ago. Um, and it's the story of the journey. I told you this was a painful lesson in sort of assay development. So one of the critical things we learned is that we sort of had assumed that if you don't treat samples nicely, that the norepinephrine degrades in the samples, right? When we want to look at norepinephrine levels, the labs are very persnickety about how you collect it. You have to collect it cold, add preservatives and all that. We didn't do that with these samples because we didn't care about norepinephrine. In fact, we wanted it to go away. But like Steven Seagal, the norepinephrine was hard to kill, right? <laughs> it was in these samples. We took samples out of the freezer years later and we sent it off and you can see here that both in serum and plasma, there was a lot of norepinephrine. I can't tell you it's the same amount there was on day one, but it wasn't zero. And that was potentially a problem. And so we wanted to try and break down the norepinephrine. And there are a couple of enzymes that do that. In fact, most patients have both uh, in steps. One is a, one called COMT, uh, and then the other is uh, monoamine oxidase or MAO. 
So David Kem then took samples and added COMT and showed that actually that we can decrease activity uh, at the beta receptor when we gave COMT, telling us that we had norepinephrine contamination. This was a problem. So Eureka, we had figured out how to do this assay. We just add COMT and reanalyze it, and then we couldn't get any more COMT. So Sigma stopped making it and selling it, and so that didn't work. Um, so then we redid the assays with MAO, monoamine oxidase. And what you see here is data that uh, was in the publication, but we did, with the MAO, the antibody activity of the alpha receptor decreased in the POTS patients. And that was actually a significant decrease. The decrease in the control subjects was significant, but less so. Right, so importantly, there's still more activity in the POTS patient. It's not that that was a fundamental untruth. It's still true there's more activity. But the way we're measuring it actually was a problem if we don't account for the norepinephrine, because that's having its own effect that's not insignificant. OK, so I'm not going to go through this, because this actually reiterates what we found and Arthur found in a larger cohort. But this is from the patients that we had in the study. We did eventually find, even with the good assay that took us years to develop, there was greater alpha adrenergic receptor and beta adrenergic receptor activity. But you have to do it the right way. So um, the conclusions from the study are just, you know, there's a lot of methodological issues when you do these assays that we have to take into account. It's not as simple as yay or nay. Um, and, you know, the truth is we learned a lot in the last few years on how to do these. So norepinephrine, which we sometimes measure in you guys um, clinically, can make a difference. It can linger in samples, and we have to actually pay attention to that and probably get rid of it if we're looking at functional assays. If we're looking at ELISAs, we have to recognize they're different than functional assays. And in fact, we're hoping with the group in Sweden to actually compare the two assays, because one's easier. If it works just as well, that would be great. But we just don't know right now if it does. That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>